Welcome to class. Today we will talk about mushroom biology and fungal genetic and growing the straw mushroom. Most fungi are inconspicuous because of their small size uh, and their structures, their cryptic lifestyle in soil or on dead matters. Fungi include symbiont on plants, animal on, or other fungi, and also as parasites. Five major phyla, Citridiomycota, Zycomycota, Ascomycota, Basidiomycota, and Glomeromycota. Most cultivated mushrooms belong to the Ascomycota or the Basidiomycota. And this is just a picture demonstrating the diversity of fungi. So roughly there are 2.2 million to 3.8 million species of fun fungi uh, and about 148,000 species of fungi have been described uh, and roughly 22,000 species uh, are basidiomycetes of this. 10,000 species produce basidios carp of sufficient size and suitable texture to be considered as a possible food source. So of the 10,000 species, about 50% 50, uh, 50 of the species are considered to possess varying degree of edibility. Uh, approximately 10% of the mushroom are poisonous to some degree, and about 30 species are deadly. This may be an underestimation. So only 200 species have been cultivated, 20, uh, 20 of these species uh, are commercialized. So what is a fungus? So a fungus is a eukaryotic which is possessing a nucleus which is one of the features that set them apart from bacteria. They are spore producing. They, they are a chlorophyllous which is devoid of chlorophyll which set them apart from the plants. They are organisms with absorbent uh, nutrient Nutrient absorbed through the cell wall, which generally set them apart from animal, and they often produce both sexually and asexually uh, uh, mycelium, known as hyphae, or filament known as hyphae or mycelium. These are usually tubular, branched, interconnected, interwoven, and are typically surrounded by cell wall consisting of mainly chitin and beta 1 3 glucan. This definition demonstrates the unique, uniqueness of fungi. They are not bacteria, plants, or animal. Instead, they are their own unique kingdom of life. If you get quite technical, based on DNA and other evidence, fungi are more closely related to animal than to plants. Fungi are gigantic. So, unlike green plants, fungi do not possess chlorophyll and cannot produce food on their own. Instead they live off on food originally produced by plants or animal, hypho, hyphae filaments, uh, hyphae or filament running through leaf litter on the forest floor for example form an extensive network that breaks down organic matter by excreting enzyme and other absorb, uh, absorbing the carbohydrate, amino acid, vitamin and other nutrient through the wall of the hyphae. Although it usually goes unnoticed, the mycelium of a single fungus can extend over acres of forest and reach several feet underground. Scientists have demonstrated that some fungi grow to gigantic portion. In an eastern Oregon forest, a colony of armillaria, which produced a bundle of hyphae called rhizomorph, was estimated to cover more than 2,000 uh, acres. The weight of the colony may exceed 200 tons. So if the colony is considered a single organism, then it's one of the largest, if not the largest organism on Earth. And you can read more about this in a news article that I post in the class handout. So this is armillaria fruiting on a tree, and this is the bundle of uh, hyphae that they form called rhizomorph. Uh, Aero map uh, in organs it's areas covered by by the fungus basically uh, that scientists determine and it basically slowly devour any tree that's in its way So the mycelium of a mush mushroom producing fungus usually remain out of sight underground and are embedded in its substrate So a fungus may fruit years after years in the same place for the, from the same mycelial body. 
So when the condition are right, the fungus might see them form a knot called a pin or primordia. So this is pins and primordia, which develop into a mushroom fruiting body. So the fruiting body produces the seed-like spores that serve as a reproductive unit. A typical mushroom produces millions of spores dispersed by wind, water, insects, or other animal, and these grow into mycelium in the new location. So this is a picture of a puffball releasing spores. So most of the fungi that are cultivated produce spores on two types of large fleshly fruiting body. Uh, the basidial mycete typically produce four basidial spores on the outside of a club-like microscopic cell called basidia, singular as basidium. These are found on the edge and face of gills of typical mushroom, but they do occur on the outer surface of icicle-like projection on lion's mane mushroom and on convoluted surface of jelly mushroom. In bolides like porcini, which we can't cultivate, the basidia lines the inner surface of pores on the undersurface of the cap. The other board category of mushroom are ascomycetes, which produce ascospores usually in eight inside a spherical finger like sac called asci, or ascus for singular. So, this is a typical mushroom with gills, and on the gills, you see, uh, on these gills, you see basidia cells. Uh, basidial cells here producing carrying four basidial spores. This is a cup like or ascus, and you see in the ascus, uh, in the asco, uh, uh you have individual as ascus, uh, and then these ascus has uh, eight asco spores. So, while the spore bearing cells are microscopic, the mushroom producing basidial mycetes and ascomycetes often can be distinguished by the shape of the fruiting bodies. Fungi which have gills, teeth, tubes, pores, or spherical above ground spores, uh, uh, spore sacs, or usually basidial mycetes. While fungi which are shaped like cups, saucer, or goblets are usually ascomycetes. The morel is an ascomycetes and can be thought of as cups joined together on a stalk. True truffle, which we don't know how to cultivate or ask my seat. Fruiting bodies of truffle are extremely convoluted and compressed cups that fruits uh, below ground. And you see this is your oyster with the typical gills, you have teeth like structures and then pores, all sign of uh, basidial mycetes. And this is saucer or cup like and morel. So remember the first question uh, you ask when you want to cultivate a particular mushroom is how does it make a living? Is it a primarily composed of wood, for example? So as a group, fungi can grow on almost any carbon source or substrate. Many fungi, including mushroom formers or saprophytes, also termed saprophytic, obtaining their food by colonizing dead organic matter, which is usually plant matters or plant material of some kind. These are the one that we will cultivate. Most cultivated mushroom are wood decomposing or called primary decomposer. So the first organism to colonize wood or leaves by breaking down cellulose uh, and lignin. For example, oyster mushroom and shiitake, they are considered primary decomposer. And follow that, we have secondary decomposer, which grow on compost material. For example, the button mushroom and the inky cap, the coprinus. Uh, in the compost, the action of other fungi and bacteria break down plant residue into smaller component. Heat, carbon dioxide, uh, and other residue uh, are produced by the composting. In tertiary decomposer, they live in habitat that are transformed by primary and secondary fungi. These habitats, which may take years to make, are in hospital in hospital for most mushroom producing fungi. Tertiary mushroom are difficult to cultivate and some example are puffball. So this is typical uh, yellow oyster mushroom a primary decomposer, you have button mushroom secondary decomposer and you have puffball or tertiary decomposer. Other mushroom producing fungi are parasites. So a parasite is basically living on plant, animal or other fungi. 
So most of these are also, uh, you know, most of these, they get something out of the, their host, their parasi parasite, right? So some mushroom-forming fungi encounter in a viral or parasitic and pathogenic, like the R malaria, which cause R malaria root rot, the cause of the extensive economic loss of ornamental trees, fruit trees, nut trees, and the timber industry. So this R malaria is devouring these trees, right? And it's like you see the mycelium actively growing on this uh, this uh, uh, timber, and also you can see that the, they form rhizomorph as well. And then beside par parasitics, you have a mutual relationship, so a beneficiary partnership between the fungus uh, that lives in the roots of a plant. So the plant usually provides sugar to the fungus, and the plant in return receives mineral, especially phosphorus, from the fungus. Uh, this relationship is called mycorrhizal. The name mycorrhizal is derived from the Greek word myco meaning fungus and rhiza meaning roots. So the mycelium penetrate the roots and in some case form a sheets around it. The mycelium radiates from the mycorrhizal roots and explores the soil. The mycelial network greatly increases the absorbent surface area of the roots and mine the soil for nutrients such as phosphorus, zinc, copper, potassium, nitrogen, which is passed to the host plants. And see, this is a young pine seedling, right? The root is not that extensive, right? And all of this right here is mycelium mass, which makes uh, the pine tree possible to grow. Some plants send up to 30% of their car carbon they produce from the photosynthesis to the mycorrhizal fungal partner. Uh, or partners more than one. Uh, the root of a plant can be infected by, by like many different species of fungi, uh, because fungal hyphae are about fifty times finer than feeder roots on tree. Fungi can effectively explore the soil uh, than root alone. Phosphorus, in particular, is important in this relationship, because phosphorus is immobile in the soil. Root of the mycorrhizal fungi must grow very near and in close contact with the phosphorus for the mineral to be absorbed. A plant may receive up to 100% of the phosphorus supply for mycorrhizal. Without this mycorrhizal association, pine, fir, manzanita, oak, aspen, birch, and many other tree species will struggle to survive in some soil. It's been estimated that mycorrhizal hyph hyphae can be one third to one half of living mass in certain soil. Uh, this tree growing on a rock is made possible because of the mycorrhizal interaction. Forests of pine and oak and other trees provide collectors a bounty of mycorrhizal mushroom. Network of hyphae or, or micro, uh, of mycorrhizal fungi result in a kind of nutrient highway between trees. So in a tree with a nutrient deficiency in a nutrient sink relative to a healthy tree, may receive nutrient from a healthy tree via connecting hyphae. No one knows how to produce mushroom from mycorrhizal fungi in cultures. If you figure out how to grow porcini, chanterelle, truffle, for example, all of this are choice mycorrhizal edible, you will be a multi-millionaire overnight. So for now, we for class, we focus primarily on saprophytic uh, mushroom producing fungi. And you see fungi produce, producing basically under the root of a tree uh, this is uh, truffle. It's interesting to note that colonization of land plants about 500 million years ago may not have been uh, possible without the system of symbiotic fungi. At that time, and in the absence of soil, the first plant, which were likely relative of the liverwort, were rootless like the liverwort and may may have depended on fungi to access nutrient in the water. So the hyphae or hypho of most fungi go unnoticed underground or in their substrate. However, some fungi, including some mushroom producing fungi, produce sclerotia or sclerotium for singular, which are hard resting bodies resistant to unfavorable condition. So sclerotia comes in various size and re remain dormant for a long period of time and germinate when the uh, condition are favorable. And you can see right here are some type of sclerotia. They are dark 
to you know protect the the the, the spores from the sun they can survive in the soil without any water for years decades easily uh you know uh, they are and you can see that once the condition once it's moist where it's water condition all right they start producing uh mushroom other structures fungal structures or uh, that fungi possess or uh, septa septas are basically a cross wall between the cells right you see this one cell has to cross wall over here and then associate with a septa usually that's cross wall over here is usually a uh, a clamp connection most mushroom have clamp connection which is a bridge like hyphal connection between two adjacent cell so reproduction is uh, in in mushroom there's two types there's asexual usually the formation of spores uh, which is not common or more among mushroom producing fungi and then we have sexual which is characterized by the union of two nuclei or karyogamy followed by meiosis a special uh, type of sexual cell division so cells that contain different uh, kind of nuclei in the same cells are called heterokaryotic, homokaryotic when all the nuclei are similar. See, this is asexual reproduction. Basically, asexual spores germinate, form mycelium, produce spores, and then continue the cycle. Uh, not too common in, in mushroom-producing fungi. And this is a cycle of a, a sexual producing fungi. Three phases of sexual uh, reproduction are one is plasmogamy, which is a union of two protoplasts, which is the inner content of its cells that brings the nuclei together within the same cells. So the act of hyphofusion is called anastomosis. And then after that, you have karyogamy, which is a union of two nuclei. In most mushroom producing fungi, karyogamy does not follow anastomosis immediately. So cell usually contain two nuclei. This pair of nuclei is called dikaryon. And a cell divide, the dikaryotic condition is continued from cell to cell uh, via the clamp connection. Meiosis is a type, and then this, the third step is meiosis, which is the type of cell division where haploid cells are produced. Uh, this is basically a, a, a outline of of sexual reproduction of of a cell of a mushroom so in plasm plasmogamy a union of the protoplast so here you have spores germinating that's two type of mating type right they they sense each other so they anastomosis to form uh, plasmogamy so they join together and you see the, the the union right here and then the cells have two uh, nucleus so dikaryon so this is a dikaryotic cell plasmogamy again uh, you know uh, more example of it you can see this two hyphae right here are sensing each other and then once they sense each other the anastomosis the form and plasmogamy occur uh, where the contents are shared and this is individual spores germinating and anastomosing to each other After plasmogamy, uh, karyogamy does not follow immediately. So cells usually contain two nuclei, like I mentioned. The pair of nuclei is called dikaryon, and as a cell divide, uh, the dikaryon is continued through the process of uh, clamp connection. So here you see two cell, the sense is other, the anastomosis, uh, the plasmogamy occur, and then now this is you know the cell has more than one nucleus. And then the clamp connection continue this 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 uh, dikaryon state. And see here's a picture of a, a clamp connection. And then next you have meiosis. Meiosis is a type of cell division where haploid cells are produced. Nuclear fusion eventually occur in the fruiting body, so the basidial carps of the mushroom. Um, interest. This leads to production of sexual spores called basidial spores after meiosis. Four bacterial spores are usually produced on each bacidium uh, or, on, or in a bacidial carp. So over here you can see two spores that germinate two different mating type. Uh, they are compatible, so they anastomosis or they go, go undergo plasmogamy and then they find uh, they form a dikaryon. Here is dikaryon. 
the carry-on go to you know continue to a clamp connection state, and then they finally form, uh, they fuse to karagami, uh, karagami, and then that undergoes meiosis to produce individual spores uh, called basidial spores. In ascomycete, uh, a few of which produce edible ascocarp, like the morel, sexual spores are called ascospores. Usually there's eight ascospores are produced in a ascus or a sac-like structure. In ascomycete, uh, like cup fungi, true truffle, morel, the spores are called ascospores. Just keep that in mind. Uh, here you have an ascocarp, which is the fruiting body of a of a ascomycetes, and in this ascus right here, an individual ascus, uh, you can see here there's eight ascospores, and this is morel, and this is truffle. So here you can see the basidial spores are produced on on gills like structures, right? The basidia uh, produce basidial spores on gill like structures, and then this summarize. Again, we mentioned about the ascocarp and then the ascus and the ascospores. So, basidiomycetes are about 90% uh, heterothallic, which is too unlike nuclear must pair for successful sexual reproduction. So, the production of a mushroom and the basidiospores require two uh, mating pair. In other words, the arrival of spores on a suitable substrate may result in spore germination and the production of hyphae, but the production of fruiting body required by CDM from two spores of different mating type. In the simplest heterothallic bacidiomycete, single bacidial spores, one male and one female, to use an incorrect but understandable animal analogy, each germinate to produce hyphae of a single parental type. The hyphae have a simple cross wall and will never fruit. Analysis must occur between compatible cells like male and female to produce a dicarion. The dicarion is characterized by the binucleus, so two nuclei cell which is which have the clamp connection at each septum. The dicarion is a fertile mycelium. So here you see the clamp connection at the septum and then the dicarion being continued. Uh, and this is a microscope picture of it. So, the pair of nuclei of a dicaryon comprise of two parental genotypes. These hyphae have the potential to, to produce mushroom. Here is an important point. So, if you look at the hyphae of your culture under a microscope and you do not see a clamp connection, your strain may never produce mushroom. If you do see a clamp connection, your culture may be f uh, fertile. I say maybe because in some complex mating system found in some mushroom, which we won't cover here, clamp connection may be present, yet the culture cannot fruit. So this is important if you want to breed mushroom or if you start a uh, culture from spore. In the latter case, you might want to make sure your culture was started with many spores. That way. You you are probably assured you have a different parental type uh, and a fertile dicarion as a result. So here you see the spores, and when you play out the spores, all the spores germinate, and you want to let this whole thing cover the mycelium mass, right, so that all that mycelium form a dicarion in here. And you can take a section out here when all the mycelium, you know, anastomos, and you are sure that you can get a dicarion that way. So if you buy or are given a culture or start a culture directly from a mushroom, you are starting with a fertile dicarion and you don't need to worry. In fact, most of the time you'll be working with a fertile dicarion and you are good to go. But just be aware of the need of a dicarion. It's only when working with cultures from single spores that cause concern. And unless you are a mushroom breeder, you are not starting cultures from a single spores. So this is, you know, tissue cultures is the easy, safe way to do it. There are exceptions. So clamp connection, though to be considered diagnostic for basidiomycetes, are not found in the Agaricus species. For example, the Agaricus bisporus, the button mushroom, is unusual because the basidia also only bear two spores. That's why it's called bi bisporus. Uh, and the mycelial cells are multinucleate. So most mushrooms are uninucleate, so one nucleus per cells, 
or binucleus, so two nuclear per cell. But the bisporus has three, five, so. So the compatible of hyphae to fuse anosmosis is regulated by genetic, genetically by mating types or factor. The mating type in a particular genes uh, which prevent a spores or monokaryotic hyphae, uh, one with a single nucleus type, from fusing sexually with a, any spores or hyphae carrying the same type of genes. So hence the presence of different genes is required for sexual reproduction to occur. So in any one species, there may be a number of these mating factors within the population. In general, any one of them is compatible with any other except those with identical mating type. The consequence of this kind of control uh, fertility is the promotion of outbreeding, which result in greater genetic variation within the population. This increases the capacity of fungus to adapt to environmental change. So mating is complex control by a lot of genes. Mating factors in most mushrooms are quite complicated, right? The number of mating type or genders may be large because each gene can have hunt or individual variation or allele. And each pair of allele specific, uh, specify a different mating type. Uh, for example, in one well-studied mushroom, the Scytherophyllium commune, there are 350 allele for set A and 60 allele for set B. Uh, this combination produced 21 different kind of mating uh, pairs. Since a large number of allele for mating types locus in the population at large, uh, any random spores has a higher probability of being compatible with a spore from another strain. So this, again, this system, you know, increased the outcrossing uh, within the species. Uh, and discouraged uh, inbreeding. In so this is a, um, you know, a rustler, a mushroom species, same species producing different color caps, for example. So strain that meet with themselves are homothallic. So a single spore of a homothallic fungus is usually capable of making a fertile dicaryotic colony. This is unusual, but it does occur. So there are two types of homothallism. Uh, the first one is primary. And the second one is secondary. So in primary homothalism, spores germinate, form monokaryotic colonies. They eventually become dikaryotic and fruit normally. So for example, this is the straw mushroom we're going to look at later today. In secondary homothalism, each spore receives one nucleus, one, uh, one nucleus of each mating type. So generating a dikaryotic colony from the moment the spores germinate. So the bun mushroom a characterized by spores has this type of mating system. This is the straw mushroom and this is the button mushroom. To make things even a little more complicated, there's another system that governs whether or not a fungus can fuse or anastomosis. So let's think about a fungus growing inside a log. It consists of a network of hyphae that grows in every direction. What happens when the hyphae tip meet? If a hyphae the hypho tip recognizes the other hypho tips uh, as a same mating strain or mating type. It will fuse, and then everything is great. What happens when it meets another species or its own species but a different strain? In other words, vegetatively incompatible. So they will lay down a highly resistant compound where they meet each other. These are called barrage lines or zone. Uh, their function is to wall off other fungus, a type of fight in mushroom world. Uh, we could look at it that way. So where there are many barrage line in a piece of wood, the result can be quite attractive. People who work with wood like to make plates, vase, and other wor works with this wood, called splatted wood. See the reading material for this week to uh, read more on this type of wood. The woodworker must use the wood before the decay process is too advanced, otherwise the wood would not would be rotted. You can see over here, you can control it, producing all type of uh, high, highly valuable wood. So we will be growing the paddy straw mushroom today, virtually. Uh, so this mushroom is uh, uh, called Vovaria vovavisiae. Uh, it's quite unique, unlike other mushrooms we will study. 
This mushroom is produced in very humid condition, uh, but it requires warm temperature, not cool. In fact, refrigeration will kill this fungus in culture. It also grow very quickly uh, and you know colonize the substrate pretty fast. Pin and young mushroom just visible can form in just four days after spawning. So the straw mushroom is one of the six most important mushrooms in the world in terms of production. In Southeast Asia, it's, grow, uh, it's grown both indoor and outdoor, often on rice growers up. Often rice growers supplement their income by cultivating this mushroom. Uh, I grew mushroom when I was in Asia, uh, this mushroom. So it's, it's very easy to grow, you know. Um, the, it, over in the U.S., you typically want to grow this in late spring or summer, uh, as this mushroom only fruit above 80 Fahrenheit, and actually prefer temperature around 96 uh, or 90 and above. So this mushroom fruit pretty quick, so about five to seven days after spawning. So, so after the when so when the fruit, about eighty percent of the yield will be harvested within like fifteen days, and another fifteen days later, uh, it will fruit again, and you can harvest twenty percent of the remaining yield. So it grows on on straw, but sometimes slightly composted dry vegetable waste, you know, wood, any any is a decomposer, so anything like that. So what you need, so you need spawn to grow this mushroom and only spawn. You can use grain spawn, um, it's usually used but you can use sawdust. Uh, then you need straw, uh, usually people supplement the straw with bean flour, rice, bran, uh, any organic waste to increase the organic content of, of, straw, of, uh, of the straw rate. So the best key to success is to keep in mind the number one rule of mushroom cultivation it's maintaining humidity, uh, and in, in this mushroom, humidity and heat uh, is, is crucial. So first, you select and prepare your substrate, right? So if you're growing with straw, the straw is soaked for one or two days or more, more or less, and, you know, it's very forgiving. Uh, so this begins the composting process, breaking down the straw somewhat and allowing it to absorb water. The straw is then allowed to drain completely. And in, in some, some indoor farm, the straw and the supplement are allowed to ferment a few days before it's steamed to be pasteurized. You don't need to pasteurize this one, uh, but if you want to, the yield does increase when you pasteurize or when you, you uh, sterilize the straw. So after the straw has been soaked and drained, the straw is then stacked and inoculated with grains spawn and often supplement with some type of bean flour, rice bran, or any organic waste. So the bed may be covered with plastic to maintain humidity and to achieve temperature 86 to 95 Fahrenheit. It can be as that simple, you know. As spawn grow, the pile of straw continues to heat by thermogenesis, which is cell produce, production of heat by respiration of microorganisms utilizing the substrate. So some, some grower covers up with a tarp, you know, some grow it, do it outside, uh, basically. So after the sh after this, um, you know, after spawning usually occur, about 18 days, 15 to 18 days after you, 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 you uh, inoculate the, the straw. So the total time, the total harvest is about one to two months. So in the first 15 days to 18 days, you get one flush, one harvest, which is roughly about 80% of the yield. And then again, about 15 to 20 days, you get another flush, which is usually about 20% of the yield. So you can harvest this in the egg form, which right here is very highly desirable, or you can harvest this while, you know, when it's the, the mushroom is fully formed. Thank you so much, and, you know, looking forward to you guys in the next, uh, next class.